Star Trek Generations is the stupidest movie ever made. It ruined everything, and not just Star Trek movies, but everything. Why make a, a video review of this movie after it's been out for like 14 years? Well, the truth is, I've got nothing better to do. But I've always wanted to articulate all the little points about what I hate about this movie. So let's begin, shall we? The Transition once again, we've saved civilization as we know it. And the good news is they're not going to prosecute. So Star Trek VI concluded the movies of the original cast pretty well, I think. Kirk and the crew, they, they saved the president of the Federation. Scotty killed the bad guy. And then they solved a mystery that Scooby-Doo couldn't solve. And in the end, they all gathered around and posed for a picture that nobody took. And then the Enterprise, it sailed off into the sunset. Second star to the right. And straight on till morning. And they were hanging their hats up, their space hats. Moving on to retirement. But no, they couldn't leave well enough alone. So then it came time for the Next Generation movie. And what I'm guessing happened was that people in the studio were probably a little scared about making a Star Trek movie without the original crew members. So, in true stupidity, they, uh, they added a couple and, and made it kind of a, a combination movie, uh, which was stupid. So instead of making a really great Next Generation movie with a really good story, really good action. They had to squeeze in Kirk and a couple other characters, whoever else wanted to be in it. The story certainly isn't about Chekhov, nor is any one page about Chekhov. Uh, it still, uh, I feel that uh, I'm, I've been given the opportunity to invest some character in, into, the, into the dialogue. Nice to see you in action one more time, Captain Kirk. Sulu had his own command, they forgot to ask Michelle Nichols, and they asked Spock, but he said, uh, he said no, because the script sucked. Go to hell. So then there you are, they're launching the Enterprise B, and you have an awkward, partial first original cast. Only ones who were lame enough to show up showed up. The other ones didn't show up because they had better things to do. So that made it weird. They made it weird from the beginning. Number two, things don't make sense. So the script for Generations reads like uh, my dead wife wrote it. And my dead wife didn't know much about Star Trek. Now she don't know much about anything. So in the beginning, the captain of the Enterprise B says, Ladies and gentlemen, we've just cleared the asteroid belt. Our course today will take us out beyond Pluto and then back to space dock. Just a quick run around the block. Then, of course, they get a distress call. We're picking up a distress call, Captain. Then, like in a true Star Trek thing, they're the only ship in range. The ships are bearing at 310 Mark 215. Distance, three light years. Signal the closest starship. We're in no condition to mount a rescue. We're the only one in range, sir. Now that's okay, because that makes it kind of exciting if they're the only ship that can be there. But, if you'll recall, they were going to sail around Pluto. Our course today will take us out beyond Pluto. Which puts them just inside the Earth's solar system. So they're near Earth, in the heart of the Federation. And they're the only ship in range? Earth is the headquarters of the Federation. There should be like hundreds of ships all over the place flying around. They got the, the shipyards near Mars. They got probably tens of ships floating around here or there. And they could zip around at the warp speed. So I don't understand. Then you got a gigantic space ribbon that's flying around heading towards Earth. And it's three light years away. Shouldn't somebody have sounded an alarm? There's a thing coming at us. There's a thing coming at us. Number three. 
Not everybody got the memo about the uniforms. So now you got half the original crew and half the uniforms from the Deep Space Nine. I don't understand this. But Starfleet is like a military organization. You know? So they say, look, we got new uniforms. Everyone put them on the first of next month. Instead, they kind of said, yeah, put them on whenever you want to. It's just a f***ing uniform. So if you run into an alien species that wants to join the Federation, and they're all like, what's going on with the uniforms? We don't know what's going on. Number four, different lighting. While it's painfully obvious they shot parts of Star Trek VI on Next Generation sets, they, uh, they carefully covered up parts where you could tell this by putting random crew members in the way, just kind of staring. But what's weird to me is that the Enterprise D suddenly looked different. For seven years on the show, we were used to seeing it look one way. Nice, even TV lighting. But since it's a movie, they had to get fancy. So it's just weird because it's different now. And I don't like things that are different. Let's take a look at Data's quarters before and now after. See? See what I'm talking about? It got dark or something. And I don't like things that are different. Number five, Picard's stupid photo album. So Picard learns that his family died in a fire. He takes a moment out of his busy day to kind of look at some photos, reminisce a bit. Looking at pictures of his family on like a computer screen or his little laptop wouldn't have been as emotional. So Picard's an old fashioned guy. He likes books and Shakespeare, archeology span and old pots. So it makes sense that he'd have a photo album. But because this movie sucks, they had to ruin the photo album too by putting this dumb little holographic border around the picture. Did they really need to have a space photo album? Now what purpose does the little reflective hologram borders around the picture serve? Other than to distract you from the picture. Why did they put that on? Number six. Data's motion chip is different looking. Yep, I'm complaining about this. See, the thing is, they made it look like a giant computer processor. That's so people in the audience that don't know about Star Trek know what the hell's going on. I guess that's alright, but it just looks so different from what it looked like before. They made this movie for people that like Star Trek, right? So when Data was going to blast it with a phaser, completely disregarding any kind of safety hazards, he takes a look at the chip, you know, and he's like, maybe someday, Geordi, maybe someday I'll put this chip in my head and laugh at your jokes. So then that day finally comes after he pushed Dr. Crusher in the water and he says, Jordy, I want to put the emotions chip in my brain. And it's like 500 times bigger and it looks different. So the data doesn't say anything about it because he didn't remember what it looked like. And Jordy didn't know what it looked like either. So they, they stick it in his brain. Number seven, Sauron's space rocket and a bunch of other shit that doesn't make sense. Ah, oh, yes, Captain. Thank you for coming. Malcolm McDonald plays a villain named Sauron. He wants to extinguish a sun to make a giant space ribbon pass over a planet and pick him up. He'll do this by firing a rocket into the sun. What? First off, Picard and the crew know about his plan. Him and Data figure it out in the, in the room with the map. So then they go to the planet to try and stop Sauron. When they get to the planet though, they run into a Klingon ship that has Geordi kidnapped. They offer a prisoner exchange that makes no sense. Then I will beam to his location. Then I will beam to your ship and you can transport me to Sauron. I will be your prisoner. But first, you must beam me to the surface so that I can speak with Sauron. So when they get Geordi back and they beam Picard down, everyone kind of goes about their normal business. I'd like to run a level 3 diagnostic on the port plasma relays. And they forget about what's happening. Why didn't they just, like, beam down hundreds of security guards to go shoot Sauron? Or send down some shuttles? Or, or fire a shot at the Klingon ship and disable its weapons? 
They could have just beamed Picard right back up after they got Geordi and said, suckers, and started firing photon phasers all over the planets. This was once a sea. So we're on the seabed of an ancient sea. But since they didn't do that, we got to talk about this fucking rocket. Now, I'm not a man of science. I'm a simple man. I'm an old man. So assuming this is a Class M planet, I'd say their sun is about as far away from us as our sun is, right? According to my calculations, a solar probe launched from either the Klingon ship or the planet's surface will take 11 seconds to reach the sun. So how in the hell is Sauron's rocket going to make it that far in 11 seconds? And it will take us between 8 and 15 seconds to lock our weapons onto it. Light takes 8 minutes to reach Earth from the sun. And that's warp 1. Sauron's rocket doesn't look like it has a warp drive on it. Even if it did, Worf would still have eight minutes to shoot it down. Unless it could go like warp nine. I don't know about that though. If it was just a normal rocket, it'd probably take like a month to reach the sun. But then it blasts off. It escapes the gravitational pull of the planet and hits the sun in like five seconds. Now what is this kind of wily coyote logic? Do they expect us to believe this is bullshit? Again, not an expert in science, but I'm pretty sure that if the sun turned off, they'd freeze to death in like one trillionth of a second. But I'm not an expert in this. I just know it gets cold in my shed. Number eight, Riker's command incompetence. The way Riker commanded the Enterprise in her final moments is actually shocking. My dead wife could have done a better job, and she's dead. So the Klingons use Geordi's sunglasses to catch a glimpse of the Enterprise's shield frequency. That's it. Replay from time index 924. They set their weapons to match the frequency, and they're able to hit the Enterprise. Their weapons just go right through the shields. They have found a way to penetrate our shields. The wall would have corrected this problem. I knew. I was screaming it at the screen in the theater. And the manager told me to leave. But I knew what to do. You changed the shield frequency, stupid. Ever since the Borg, it's become a common procedure. Even Commander Tuvok knew how to do it in Voyager. How'd they get through our shields? I've been rotating the shield frequency every 10 seconds. Instead... Riker started babbling about a plasma coil. Plasma coils. Is there any way we can use that to our advantage? Plasma coil. Plasma coils. Plasma coil. Plasma coil. Plasma coil. Plasma coil. Plasma coils. Plasma coil. No problem. So instead of saying like, fire all weapons, fire all weapons repeatedly over and over again until they blow up. Keep firing photon torpedoes nonstop. You know, I could have done that. He tried to hatch some kind of brilliant plan. And really, they could have overpowered that little ship in a second. Shields or no shields. Then to make matters worse, Riker orders that dumb broad to pilot the ship. Deanna, take the helm! Get us out of orbit! I get to do something I've never done before, which is drive the ship. We'd given the keys to, like, the blind dude. You know, the kid. The teenager had the keys. We threw the keys at anyone in red who happened to be passing that day. You know, and then finally, you know. I realize he's like the captain, but according to everybody, Riker's the best pilot. You're gonna need one heck of a pilot to pull that off. Is that you? I can do it. Truthfully, the man you want is Commander Riker. And I don't think you're a particularly good first officer. But you are also the best pilot on the ship. Number nine, saucer landing. Engaging impulse engines. So that, that Troy, she's too slow on the controls and she can't hit the buttons fast enough to make the saucer part fly away from the part that's gonna blow up. Her general incompetence leads everybody to their doom. So she, she crashes the hull of the Federation flagship in a forest. 
I once crashed my Cadillac into the forest. That's what killed my wife. There's a bunch of smashing and crashing, people flying about. Even the furniture comes off and slides around. And then Worf takes out a little flashlight. Why does he take out a little flashlight? What's he gonna do with that? He's gonna shine it on someone? He's gonna shine a light showing somebody where they're gonna smash their face? What's he shining that light on? So then the dumbest thing happens, right? And it's very quick, very subtle. So they actually show the windows of the Enterprise break. Like smash, like a, like a glass window. They probably said, hey, the ship's sliding around. Why don't the windows break? That'll make it exciting. With all the stresses that a starship must endure, do they really think the windows are made of glass? So what are the windows made of, you ask? I'll tell you. Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. That's right. It's the same shit that Scotty used to build the whale tank out of. Admiral, there'll be whales here! In fact, Data even confirms this in an episode. The transparent aluminum alloy of this window is exhibiting a pattern of transient electrical currents. This movie just kind of throws any kind of scientific logic out the window. Out the window, get it? Ha ha ha. Number 10, the stupid nexus. Now people like to bitch about the way Kirk died. He fell off a bridge, and then the bridge fell on him. And he was trying to save a pre-industrial civilization that we never saw or would care anything about. But that's not really a plot hole. It's kind of like, uh, just something that's stupid. So Picard ends up in the Nexus in the middle of a Christmas carol or, or something. Tiny Tim is there, his Christmas tree. He realizes eventually this is all some kind of weird acid trip. This can't be real. And then he finds Guinan in his house. Guinan. But Guinan was just on the Enterprise. I thought you were on board the Enterprise. I am. I'm also here. Think of me as an echo of the person you know. Well, I guess it's Guinan's ghost or part of Guinan. Something. So if you leave, you can go anywhere, anytime. All right, I know exactly where I want to go. To the mountaintop on Viridian 3, just before Solon destroyed the star. I have to stop him. So instead of saying, like, let's go back a couple days, and then I could punch Sauron in the, in the 10 forward lounge, or let's go back a week and, uh, and never meet Sauron, he doesn't do that. You can go anywhere. Anytime. All right, I know exactly where I want to go. To the mountaintop on Viridian 3, just before Solon destroyed the star. I have to stop him. But I need help. James T. Kirk. So Bricard's like, come back with me. I need your help. We have to go back to a planet, Viridian 3. Come back with me. Millions of lives are at stake. Help me stop Solon. Come back with me and help me punch Sauron. I want you to leave the Nexus with me. We have to stop a man called Sauron from destroying a star. But Kirk's like, can I go back to the Enterprise B and not get killed? And Picard's like, no, I need someone else to help me punch Sauron. Let's go! Maybe Picard wanted to go back just a little bit because he couldn't find where he put his favorite sunglasses. The final insult. How cheap can you be to reuse a special effect? Especially one that was the finale of the previous movie. Come on! Spend the extra $60 and blow up another Klingon ship. I mean, for f**k's sake. I'm not watching this stinker for the plot. Just to be absolutely certain, we're gonna compare these two shots, okay? Maybe these two ships blew up the same way. I guess it's possible. Anything's possible in Star Trek. But you know what I think? I think they're being fucking cheap. Cheap like my wife. That's why I killed her in that fake car accident. I mean- Captain Kirk's role at the end. Captain Kirk is probably the best captain in all of Starfleet history. 
But his function at the end of Generations is not to put all of his years of experience to work while him and Picard do some kind of awesome Star Trek thing, but it's mainly just to help Picard punch the bad guy. Just who the hell are you? He's James T. Kirk. All Picard really needed was just an extra hand. In fact, moments earlier he asked Guinan to come back and help him. I need help. Now, if you were to come back with me, together we- I can't we leave. So James T. Kirk is a replacement for Guinan? Can you imagine Guinan running around on the bridge punching Malcolm McDonald? But anyway, Guinan's like, I'm a ghost, I can't help. But I know someone who can, his name's Kirk. So you got James T. Kirk in here, huh? Gee, I wish I had something more exciting for him to do, other than punch an old guy. You got any other people you know in here? Is there a Home Depot in here? I can get me a handful of day laborers to help hold down Sauron while I shut his rocket off. Why did Sauron kidnap Jordy? The only reason I could see why Sauron kidnapped Jordy was that he had some kind of passing interest in his visor. He couldn't have possibly been thinking about putting a camera on the visor and seeing the Enterprise's shield frequencies so that the Klingons could shoot down the ship eventually. In fact, they weren't even expecting the Enterprise to find them because they were cloaked. The only other reason why he kidnapped Geordi was maybe he wanted to help him get back to his roots. Ha ha ha. But seriously, in the scene, he, he comes into the room. He's got Geordi's shirt off for some reason. Then he asks him to tell him about Trilithium. I want to listen to everything you know about Trilithium. What else could Sauron need to know about Trilithium? He's already built his rocket. It's on the planet waiting to be used. He already blew up the one sun. Apparently he already knows about Trilithium and what does Geordi have to tell him more about Trilithium that he doesn't already know? Maybe he wanted to know what they knew about his experiments. Worf already knew what trimethium was. They were scanning for signature particles of a compound called trilithium. Trilithium? Yes, an experimental compound the Romulans have been working on. Trilithium is a nuclear inhibitor. Seemed pretty common knowledge. And Sauron saw Guinan in the lounge. And she knew about the Nexus. So it's kind of a question of if they were going to put two and two together. Not really how much Geordi knew. And another thing too, kidnapping the chief engineer on a starship is uh, not a good idea. It's just going to guarantee that they're going to come after you. Why can't they scan Viridian 3? What kind of stupid sh is this? Any luck, Mr. Worf? No, sir. I still cannot locate the captain. The lame excuse they use for not being able to locate where Picard beamed down to is this. The sensors can't penetrate the planet's ionosphere. There's too much interference. What is an ionosphere? I mean, sometimes they have trouble scanning planets that have crazy thunderstorm atmospheres. But this is a Class M planet with clear skies. How come the scanners don't work? Maybe then you send down a couple of shuttles through the ionosphere and you scan around. They're f captain is down on the planet with a crazy person. You'd think they'd try some things to find a Kirk gets buried under rocks. Moments before Picard is rescued, he buries Kirk's body under rocks. He could have said, I got the body of James T. Kirk here. You should beam him up too, and we can give him a proper burial. Instead, he's buried above ground under a pile of rocks. It's only a matter of time before the animals get to him. Picard finds his photo album. Now we all hate Picard's photo album. The last time we saw it, he was in his quarters with Troy, and then the sun exploded. However, at the end of the movie, Picard finds his photo album in the rubble of his ready room. There must have been some crash. So at what point did Picard take his photo album up to the bridge and then bring it inside his ready room? He never kept personal shit in there. Well, a book here and there, but he just had his fish, a little model of the Stargazer, and his laptop. He also had an orange plastic thing, but I know why it was there. It was so that he could find it and walk out on the bridge with Riker in the same scene. You know what that spells? Lazy. Picard's priceless ceramic thing. Another thing worth noting in this same scene 
is that Picard picks up an object that ended up on the floor of his ready room as well. This was something called a Curlin Nascar. Oh my God. It was given to Picard by a guy named Professor Galen, who was Picard's favorite archaeology teacher. At the time, Picard seemed to think this Curlin Nascar was the greatest thing since sliced bread. From the workshop of the Master of Darkwood Hill. It's ancient. This object is over 12,000 years old. And very, very rare. You mean it's complete? Oh. Never before in Star Trek has Picard reacted so amazed by an artifact. Professor, this is an incredible find. Pshh, who needs this? He just could not say enough good things about this, this thing. In fact, it looked like he was gonna gonna make an artifact in his pants and Professor Galen even said it's yours Picard and Picard was like no uh, how can I accept this Psh, whatever <laughs> anywho so he didn't bother to take it with him and he beams up but would he really leave the curling Nascar just lying on the ground amongst all the other junk and what about his little flute that he played in that one episode where he, he lived the whole life as an old man he didn't bother to fucking find that. I think they found this prop, and they said he's got to pick up something. And they, then they found the prop, and they're like, let's use this. What is it? I, I don't know. Picard comes out the wrong door. So after their party for Worf on the holodeck, everyone comes out to the bridge to check out what's going on at the Amorosa Conservatory. The crew comes in from the right, and then they pan, and Picard comes in from the left. Made for a nice shot, but what they forgot to tell the director was that that door in the back, that leads to the conference room. Sir, I have completed level one computer diagnostics. There's no turbo lift back there and there never was. Maybe Picard was sitting in the conference room by himself, just thinking about things. Or maybe he was expecting everybody to meet him there, but then he was a little embarrassed when they didn't, so he comes out pretending like, you know, he was all business. I do know that around the corner to the left, they got a little bathroom. It's only on the blueprints. So maybe Picard was making a captain's log. <laughs> but seriously, folks, there are three turbo lifts on the bridge of the Enterprise. There's the normal one in the back. I want some answers. There's one next to Picard's ready room. And then there's another one on the left. They never use that one, though. It's like emergency one. I think it goes straight to the battle bridge. So why does Picard come out of the door of the conference room? I hate this. And there's another shot they took from Star Trek 6 too. Right here. Oh yes. And they also reused this prop. They do that a lot though. It is revolting. There it is a motion strip subplot. A subplot generally ties into a movie somehow. However, after examining generations with a team of scientists, the only purpose we could uncover for Data's emotions chip subplot was that so it could be paralleled to Picard and Picard's challenge of doing Star Trek stuff while dealing with some pretty heavy emotions. Part of having feelings is learning to integrate them into your life, Data. Sir, I no longer want these emotions. Data had no real reason to put in the emotions chip and he never really used the emotions at the end of the movie to figure something out or do some key plot thing or something like that. Really didn't have any kind of point. Yes! <clears throat> he just played a song on the computer. You tiny little life force. And he swore. Oh shit! I think the real reason for the subplot was because it was a feature length movie and Brent Spiner wanted to do some real acting. And they needed some kind of comic relief, I guess. To me, Data's always best when he's Data. <laughs> Not some kind of asshole clown. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I hope it's gonna be a great, uh, great movie. 